Well, a couple of funny things going on around here. Kind of want to point out before he runs out of the sanctuary that young man here and his buddy Ben are going to Israel next week. Yeah, pretty amazing stuff. So, you know, I just uh, thought I'd let you guys know that so that you can keep them in your prayers. You know, traveling overseas is always an adventure, and, and in this day and age, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it can be challenging. So, good thing you're not traveling through France. So, yeah, not that Israel is much better. Sorry, Mom, I'm sure that's not exactly the best. But I want to say... Good luck and have fun over there, you know. Meet a nice Jewish girl, bring her back to Creston. Nope, okay. Yep, okay, well, (laughs) moving right on with the important business of the day, the gospel. You know, last week I got done with the sermon, I got out of here, and there was just something that was weighing on my heart. And it's, you know, it's our our politics. You know, and, and I preach and I try to preach to some of the current events of the day. But sometimes those current events almost, it's like put too much salt in the broth. You know, you, you miss what you were there for. You know, you have a, a good beef stew and if you put too much salt in there, you lose the beef, you know. And, you know, I just keep reminding myself that, you know, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, John. But um, wherever you're at, the, the most important thing is this gospel that we know Jesus gave us, the good news, the light of the world, our Savior. And so regardless of where we're at, you know, I want our fellowship to be based on that. You know, we have people that vote on, on both sides, Democrats, Republicans, and who knows, maybe we've got a Greenpeace person out here somewhere. You know, who knows? But whatever it is, it's, our focus is not on our politics. And our heart needs to be focused on his love and sharing that love. And I appreciated so much what Eve shared with us this morning. You know, we need to be out there showing the light of Jesus to this world. And when we conclude the service this morning, we're going to sing an old standard called They Will Know Us, They Will Know We Are Christians by Our Love. I want us to make sure that uh, when we are here together, our focus is on that. So we get to this section of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And I forgot to put this up on the screen, so we'll, um, we'll just read it from the text if you have your Scriptures with you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. As we continue on through this lesson on the story of the mount, Jesus gets to a very important aspect of life. Do your actions, do your words match up? Are they real? Jesus says this. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they are being heard because of their many words. It could also be said about preaching. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. 
These are wonderful sections of Scripture. You know, it's no surprise, though, that last week we ended that section of Scripture with something that Jesus said. He said this, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Tall order, big challenge. And then he goes right on into these words, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. Now that says a couple things to me right up front. One, be careful. Jesus is telling us, be aware of what you're doing. Think it through. Don't practice your faith lightly. Be aware. Your actions do speak. And they do show whether you are true to your word or if it's pretense. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. But that also implies that we are to practice our righteousness. Okay? It's not to let us off the hook that we aren't supposed to be righteous. In fact, we are supposed to be righteous. The very words of Jesus, be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect, are his challenge out before us. Even though we know that in a sense, we can't obtain God's perfection and his righteousness but we can give it our best shot. Not for the purpose of making ourselves look good, but for the purpose of bringing glory to God's name, honor to his kingdom. That's what we need to be thinking about. Jesus challenges us with this in numerous ways. And there's a couple passages of scriptures that I want to bring to your attention this morning that, that back up how the church and his disciples took him and for his word and what he, they understood him to be saying here. If we go to the book of James, chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, we hear James write this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. After having said what I said this morning already, what great words. How much healing would these words bring to our country if we were to take them seriously and practice them? Everyone should be quick to listen, to hear, to honor, to value other people's opinions and thoughts. Slow to speak. You know, one of the reasons that you have a hard time remembering somebody's name when you're first introduced to them, do you know what it is? It's because you're thinking about what you're going to say next. Instead of listening and hearing that name, you jump to what you think that person. And we do this in milliseconds in our minds. We jump to what is going to be or give the best impression of ourself to this new person we're meeting. And so we don't quite hear the name, and guess what? Two sentences later, it's gone, right? How many of you all have a problem with remembering names? How many of you have ever called me DJ? I just, I've been people's pastor for years, and after eight or so years, they still call me DJ. I just think it's hilarious. But I have a hard time with names, and it's kind of unfair because I have to remember several hundred people's names and you you guys get one you know now you probably out there uh, shaking hands with people oh nice to see you again <laughs> you know but it is it's something we easily do because we are so quick to think about what we're going to say God's admonishment to us and James's admonishment is slow down slow down be slow to speak and even more importantly I think be slow to become angry. Be slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Remember that whole thing in the very beginning? Careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. God is saying we are to practice righteous. Human Anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil so that 
that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. I think that that is one of the plainest admonitions scripture can put to us. We have to listen to God's spirit, his word, and that way we don't deceive ourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it is like one who someone it is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Then these very important words. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that, our God, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. You know, sometimes religion gets a bad name. You know, we, we've played this game from time to time where I don't have religion, I have a relationship. Well, okay, you have a relationship, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's good. Religion is a good thing. We are part of the Christian religion as opposed to other religions. We are part of a religion that teaches to love other people, even if they don't love us. We are taught that that example comes to us from Jesus who first loved us before we even knew what he was up to. And that we are to be examples of his. That's why there's a consequence to practicing righteousness. There's a consequence to practicing righteousness. And an expectation as well. I love this passage in Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46. Jesus is talking eschatologically, saying this is going to happen someday. Verse 31 says, And when the Son of Man, and that's a reference to Jesus himself, comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then this speaks to the righteous heart, this next section. And it says, and then the righteous will answer him. Notice it doesn't say, and then the sheep will answer him. The righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? Many of you know the answer. The king will reply, truly I tell you whatever you did for one of these, the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Our righteousness is expressed in the way that we love other people. And not just people who follow Christ, but all of his creation. That we are to love others. There's no condition, no exception, no qualification that we can give that excludes us from the righteous obligation of loving them even as Christ loved them and gave his life for them.
What they choose to do with that love that Christ gave them is up to them. What they choose to give, do with the love you express to them is up to them. But what's up to you is the obligation of following your Lord's example and doing the very things that he's done. To love. To clothe, to feed, to shelter. To visit. All these people. Then we get the flip side. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed. Quite a difference from being righteous. Into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me nothing to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. When I was a stranger, you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or in needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? You know, I kind of suspect, before I finish this next little part, they were surprised. They were surprised that they were not getting a fair shake. I'll bet they have a laundry list of reasons why they didn't do these things that Jesus says. I truly tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. They had a laundry list of reasons and excuses and justifications and whatever word you want to attach to it. A laundry list of, well, they, they didn't go to our church. They weren't the right kind of people. They were part of a political cause that I just couldn't support. And I know that you can make that list as long as you want to because you know those things. You hear them in the news. You see them in people. Maybe you even felt some of them in your own heart. But our challenge our challenge is to allow Christ's Spirit to move within us so thoroughly that we don't see those things in people, but rather we see their need for Jesus. And that we love them. Even when it means that we may be taken advantage of, even harmed. That we might have to turn the other cheek. Because we're doing the right thing. It's not good for the goats. You all know I had a goat one time? Yeah, his name was Al Sharpton. It was a political statement, for what it's worth. Al, Al has gone on to better pastures than my home. He's now out there with his harem of 30 girls and uh, doing quite well for himself. The prayers that are heard. Let's reread this little section of scripture again. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you and when you pray, do not keep babbling on like the pagans, for they think that they have heard, or they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know, a couple things I just want to pull out of this passage for you to, for you to kind of get some of the cultural things that were going on at this time for Jesus as He was addressing these people. There were two things. First, we learned, of course, that um, we're not supposed to do our good works in front of other people and to make it public, in a sense, um, announcing it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. And the best you can tell is that some of the wealthier Jews made their tithes, their alms, to either the synagogue or to those outside the synagogue who are oftentimes begging for assistance from their 
Jewish brothers and sisters, that, you know, they would make a big clamor about them doing something good. They would take credit for a large gift that they would give to support the synagogue. And so this was something that Jesus was pointing at. He was saying, don't do this. Don't do this. Don't draw attention to yourself because if you do, your reward's already been given. When you pray in the same way, don't don't stand up and pray to draw attention to yourself. Your reward will be given to you in full at that point. And then Jesus gives us some good insight that we should go into our rooms, pray there, close the door, pray to your Father. I want to say that what this is, I think, Jesus is trying to do for us is to draw our attention to the intimacy of our relationship with God. We talk about God on two levels theologically. One, that he is transcendent, that he is above all things. He's removed because he's holy. But God has become incarnate and imminent. He lives within us because of his Holy Spirit, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So there's this sort of dichotomy that God is yet above us still. We can understand him. He's high and lifted up, but he also resides within us because of his work through the Holy Spirit. But what this particular passage does for us is it tells us that this holy God is accessible. And he's accessible in a relationship. That prayer isn't just some um, list of things that we repeat to please him. And one of the practices that uh, pagan religions oftentimes do is they have this uh, reciprocal prayer that just goes on and on and on, repeats itself. And the more often you say it and the more often you repeat it, the, the better you are at getting in relationship with with God somehow. And so it's the number of words that you use. It's the number of times you repeat it. It's the amount of time you spend going on and on and on with that prayer. And I don't know about you, but real relationships to me don't take a lot of time. They just take presence. Sometimes the best relationships are the relationships that don't have a lot of words. Sometimes the best relationship is a hug. It's an arm around the shoulder. It's a holding of hands. It's it's the face-to-face. Learned that in the course of my marriage that I can say a lot of words, but a hug takes me to places in my wife's heart that all my words can never get to. To look into her eyes and to feel her care for me takes me to places where her many words can't get to. And I think this is the same thing with God. When we are really in a relationship with Him, when we truly are in His presence, when we experience His power, it's not because we have learned some rote set of prayers, but it's because the prayers that we have are in His presence and we look into His eyes and we feel His Spirit within us and it creates a relationship That moment when you truly feel his presence and his power. When he simply says, and you feel it, I love you. You're mine. You're my kid. You're my child. You're my God. You're my father. I praise you. When we're in that moment, prayer is powerful. And we're to be reminded that God loves us so thoroughly, he knows our every need even before we ask. Now I want to address a couple things because we kind of get hung up on this from time to time. When do we practice our acts of righteousness? 
I believe, whenever they're in front of you. There's never a good time or a bad time to practice your acts of righteousness. It's just that you don't wave your arms and say, hey, look at me first. That's it. It's pretty simple to understand. How's about prayer? You know, be careful not to be too literal with Scripture sometimes. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites where they like to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Well, if we were to take that literally, and I've heard some Christians go on about this, the only time you should pray is in your home, in your closet, by yourself. Really? What was Jesus' example? Did Jesus ever pray in public? Just a quick count of the New Testament records over 30 times that Jesus prayed in public. He prayed at his baptism. He prayed in the morning before heading off to Galilee. He prayed after healing people. He prayed all night before choosing his 12 disciples, although that might have been a little bit more. He prayed while uh, speaking to the Jewish leaders. He gave thanks to the Father before feeding the 5,000. The list goes on and on and on. So what Jesus is again saying is that there are times to pray in public. I don't know about you, but I, I, love, I love teenagers sometimes. Sometimes their rebelliousness just gets you. Sometimes you just shake your head. Other times you think, wow, they, they, they get it. There was a school back east this year who was told, you will not say the Lord's Prayer as has been your custom at your graduation. And they, the school district said, no, we're not doing this anymore. It had been part of the tradition. That was it. Morning went on as it normally had gone on and uh, they were doing their graduation services. And they got to that point and there was nobody up there to lead the Lord's Prayer. And all of a sudden, in the midst of all the students, one by one they stood up and recited the Lord's Prayer by heart. You can tell us we can't, but we're going to anyway. What a witness. You know, and there are times that we just need to know it's okay to pray in public. And it's okay to express our love and concern for other people. And that's, I think, what the purpose of prayer is. I don't think the purpose of prayer is to make political statements. I think the purpose of prayer unites us. And it demonstrates our love to other people. And sometimes we just need to stop the world and say, Lord, you are needed here. I would encourage you to never be afraid to stop and pray. Well, I want to find a spot of encouragement for you this morning. I want you to think about for a moment something good that somebody's done for you in the past. When you were the one who needed shelter or clothing when you needed someone to visit, call on you. I want you to stop for a moment and think about when somebody prayed for you and you found out that they were praying for you. A young friend of mine uh, was really having a struggle in life and he hated his family. He, as a matter of fact, he really hated his dad. He was a teenager, he was 16 at the time, and it was, it was just a rough go. They could not see eye to eye. And what turned that young man around? What got him off of the path of destruction that he was on at that particular time? He just had one of those almost Donnie Brooks with his dad. And he was storming around the house, and finally he went storming past his parents' bedroom, and the door was slightly cracked open. And he just looked in to see what his old man was doing. 
His dad was on his knees beside his bed praying for his son. You know, there's times you, you get certain privileges with your job. And this young man, his dad, came in and wanted to be baptized together. And this was my, my privilege. To see how this kid was just off on his own way and didn't want anything to do with that old man. And dad, not knowing what to do anymore, went into a quiet place by himself, put his hands up on the air, in the air, on his knees, said, Lord, bless my son. And that's the only words that kid heard. Lord, bless my son. Not change him, not make him see things the way I see him. Lord, bless my son. Kid was absolutely stopped in his tracks. God's spirit just grabbed a hold of him. He pushed the door open. He went in and kneeled down. He said, Lord, bless my dad. Wow. Prayer changes lives. Spending time with people changes lives. This is the lesson that the scriptures teach us. And tell me, that moment you thought about when someone took care of you and blessed you, were you not changed? Did you not feel God's love? And that's what you do for others. When in the name of Christ, you feed give a cup of water, clothe, visit. You bring joy. So go and be the church. Go and be the body of Christ. Go and be the only scriptures that somebody may ever read in their life. Go and be a blessing. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your kindness towards us. I pray, Father, that in this season of politics that you would help us not to put our eyes so much on what divides us, but to put us into a place where with Jesus and by the power of his Holy Spirit, we might be united and people might see and know that we are Christians because of our love for you and for this world. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing upon us and thank you for your guidance and your spirit's work in within us. Thank you, Jesus, for all the good things we have. And it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Well, stand with me. We're going to sing a couple more songs. Or No, I'm sorry, one song. <laughs> Everybody behind me is like, what? <laughs> Amy and I are going to pack up the kids this afternoon and head up to Oregon and Washington. And so I uh, appreciate your prayers. And we will be thinking and praying.